Well, a tentative deal has been reached between the union representing Canada's auto workers and Ford. Along with higher wages, the union says its key priorities were pensions and job security, as well as the transition to electric vehicles. For more on this, let's bring in Peter Fries. He's the Associate Dean of Engineering at the University of Windsor. Peter, thanks so much for making time for us. Oh, it's a pleasure. It's nice to uh, nice to be on with you. So we don't know the, the details of this tentative deal at this point, but I, I was curious to get your thoughts on this transition to electric vehicles and what some of the workers might be, you know, trying to position themselves for through these negotiations in order to play a role, a continued role in the auto industry here in Canada. How would you see it? Because you're really, you're focused on, uh, you know, you have the engineering background, the innovation background when it comes to the auto space what do you think they could have been asking for well I, I really don't know what the uh, what the uh, Unifor uh, negotiations entailed um, th the fact of the matter is that this is the the biggest technological revolution in the history of the auto industry and I think that to a certain extent, it's going to change how work gets done in many parts of the industry. Although I think that can't be overplayed because, you know, the future car will still be a car. It will have four wheels. It will have seats. It will have windows and a body and a chassis and uh, wheels and tires and a powertrain. Uh, I think the powertrain is where the biggest changes are obviously going to happen. And the manufacturer of the electric powertrain is much less labor intensive than uh, conventional internal combustion engine powertrains. So I think that's where the major changes in work will take place. So as you've been watching these um, negotiations play out, and it wasn't just in Canada, but also it is still ongoing in the U.S., um, you know, how were you expecting it to play out? Because, you know, we saw the Canadian negotiations have success, or at least tentatively, and the U.S. negotiations are ongoing, uh, still, you know, fighting for, I believe they, there are big gaps when it comes to wages and, and whatnot, um, but it was quite the time timing, wasn't it, in, in having the negotiations happening here and then the way that they're happening in the U.S. with all three automakers, the uh, strike action being taken against all three of them at the same time. That's right. The, this, this, I believe, is the first time that uh, the UAW in the United States has struck all three car companies at once. Usually they choose a target and, uh, and strike that company uh, while they negotiate with all three and then um, they carry on. The other interesting thing is they've targeted the assembly plants of the, of the most profitable products of each of the companies uh, rather than striking every plant in the whole company. Um, now, the effect is, is not too different in some respects because if, if they can't build vehicles, they obviously don't need to build engines for those vehicles. They don't need to make seats for them and all the other parts that go into the vehicle. So this is a, a, an interesting new approach by the UAW. The other thing that's different is uh, I would say their, their demands, their key demands, are, are much more aggressive than they have been in the past. And so uh, it'll be very interesting to see how that plays out. If the strike continues in the U.S. or strikes at, at those uh, various plants, like you mentioned, Peter, and potentially expands, because that sounds like a possibility at, as of Friday if the negotiations aren't fruitful, what yeah. sort of impact does that end up having on the Canadian auto industry? You know, perhaps this uh, negotiation with Ford here in Canada is in the rearview mirror, but could there still be an impact from what's ongoing in the U.S.? Oh, absolutely, without question. Uh, parts go back and forth across the border every day uh, in, the, in the billions of dollars. Uh, thousands of truckloads of parts go back and forth every day. Just as an example, I, I read yesterday that something like 25% uh, of all the Ford F-150 pickup trucks that are built uh, in North America, which are all built in the United States, they're not built in Canada anymore, but 25% of those vehicles use Canadian built engines. Well, 
as I say, if you're if you're not building the trucks, you don't need to manufacture the engines. If you don't need to manufacture the engines, you don't need the pistons, the connecting rods, the the engine blocks, cylinder heads, and all the other parts that go into an engine. Now, there's no point in just continuing to make them and stockpile them if you if you can't sell them. So, the the to a certain extent, the border is a bit of a myth in the auto industry that parts flow back and forth. And because of uh, the Free Trade Act, uh, they generally go duty free. And, and the, the smooth flow of parts back and forth across the border is absolutely central to the functioning of the industry in both countries. Peter, when you're thinking about the, the future of the industry in Canada, for example, and this you know, change to uh, incorporate more of electric vehicles, but also following perhaps these negotiations, pushing for, for better wages and, and what have you. Um, how do you see the industry evolving from the labor side of things? Because when we think of auto worker jobs of the past, very well-paying jobs um, and quite quite secure for, for the most part until the, some of them, many of them weren't. Um, how do you sort of see the industry evolving? Well, I think, I think that there will be a move towards much higher quality work uh, much more value added per employee. There will be fewer jobs that are, you know, unskilled. Uh, you know, in the good old days when young people in Detroit, Indiana, Ontario uh, could finish grade 12 and go down to their local car plant and get a good secure job for the next 35 years and retire with a fantastic pension and a brand new car as they left the plant are over. I would say um, it, it's going to require uh, a great deal of skill and knowledge, uh, a lot more education on the part of auto workers to to maintain their jobs in each factory. There will almost certainly be more robotics. For instance, in a battery plant, there is almost no point in the production process where a person touches the material that goes into the battery. It's all huh. automated, and wow. it has to be. It, it, you, can, you can't manufacture batteries uh, sort of by hand. It has to be automated or they simply don't work properly. And so, you know, a lot of work is going to change in the future. And I think that uh, uh, a lot of auto workers uh, could find themselves displaced over time as we move towards those more advanced technology vehicles. Actually putting the vehicles together in an assembly plant I'm not sure how much that's going to change because a lot of those tasks are simply not, uh, they're not easy to automate. Installing a wiring harness, for instance, nobody's ever succeeded in making a robot do that because wiring harnesses are very flexible and they're, they're kind of floppy and, and it just turns out that people are really good at installing those kinds of things. But I think there will be fewer and fewer of those kinds of jobs as you go along. Mm. 